grace and peace in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you for worshiping with us. We're privileged to offer this time of worship through the ministry of the First Baptist Church of Bryson City, North Carolina. We lift up the Almighty God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus, and we trust that by His Spirit we'll meet Him in praise and worship during these moments. I encourage you to join in with whatever responses you find helpful. Sing, pray, stand, kneel, raise your hands, take notes, confess sin, and surrender to God. Be at liberty in the Spirit. Together may we see God more clearly, savor Him more fully, and share Him more freely. Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship. It's good to have these special times and special places that we can draw near to the Lord. So wherever you are, a few folks here are worship leaders in the sanctuary here and many folks at home and joining online, welcome and let's just use this time to draw close to the Lord this morning that he may be close to us. As we begin worship, uh, just a few announcements uh, this week. Uh, uh, our sister in Christ, Miss Tracy French, died this past Wednesday. Just wanted folks to be aware of that. And this coming Tuesday, July 7th, will be a time of visitation at 5 p.m. here at the church sanctuary and a memorial service at 6 p.m. That's this Tuesday, July 7th. Uh, we will be, uh, of course, observing all the recommendations and guidelines and orders uh, with masks and, and distancing and, uh, and all as, as well as we can during that memorial service and visitation. But remember the family of Miss Tracy French, her son and daughters and all those that uh, were close to her. And we celebrate her home going and we grieve her loss here among us. So let's uh, continue in worship in a time of prayer. Father, we are thankful for these special times and special places that we gather in your presence. And I pray that we are transformed in these times. Lord, thankful that we, we live in this, this free country, this weekend that we celebrate uh, the birth of a nation, our the Independence Day of the United States. And Father, we're thankful for that, and we pray for liberty and justice for all people. Lord, we pray that all people will make choices that lead to tranquil and dignified and godly lives. Let us meet you in these moments, Lord, that we may be changed into your likeness to do just that. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As we continue in worship this morning, uh, I want to introduce our special music. It is a video recording of our sanctuary choir uh, singing a mighty fortress is our God, so welcome First Baptist Church Sanctuary Choir. <laughs>
If you'll join me in our scripture reading this morning, I'm going to be reading from Psalm 145, verses 8 through 14. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercies are over all his works. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your godly ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your powers to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. Let us pray. Lord, I just thank you this morning for this scripture reminder that you are gracious and merciful, that you're slow to anger and great in loving kindness. I'm not sure, Father, that there are words that could be more impactful to our lives at this moment. And I'm not sure that there are would be any greater way for us to live and express ourselves in our community that is filled with such chaos and hurt and confusion except to try to extend your grace and your mercy and your loving kindness to all those with whom we come in contact. Just pray that you'll lead us and guide us in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Millie. And thank the Lord for bringing us here this morning in this moment of worship. The text this morning uh, may seem a little odd for Independence Weekend, but I tell you, it's more at the heart of what uh, I think we need to hear than any text I can imagine. Jesus saying, Come unto me, all ye who are uh, weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What is freedom about if not uh, in some large measure the ability to rest, to really be at ease, uh, to enjoy the prosperity, the peace which God offers. And so I I tell you, listen to this text, and let's hear a little bit about some of the hurdles that we're facing this morning, uh, this day, this month, this this last 17 weeks this year, um, not only in in the issues of of social turmoil, but of uh, the pandemic and all the mess that's around us. Let's hear about God and how we might get closer to him and rest in Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 11, verse 16 is where we begin reading. But what shall I compare? To what shall I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to the other children and say, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither uh, eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades, for if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. 
Yes, Father. For this way was well pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, Jesus said, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Bow with me for prayer. Oh God, for rest in this day we desire, Lord, we pray, we call out a genuine rest which is uh, funded not by simply the absence of conflict, Lord, but by a deep peace which overwhelms our souls as we find our hope in you. Forgive us, Lord, for succumbing to despair. It's natural, it's real, it cannot be denied. But Lord, help us to trust you, to admit our fears, and to relax in you. I pray all this as we wait upon your spirit, O God. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen and amen. There are hurdles keeping us from rest, keeping us from freedom, keeping us from what we need in Christ Jesus. There are hurdles that we must jump. There are obstacles that are in the way. Jesus simply said in verse 28, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. The Lord Jesus invited the disciples to take their rest, their relief, their, their freedom, if you please, in him. And God offers himself in relief of our burdens, I want to tell you this morning, because he's good, and as the psalmist said, his loving kindness lasts forever. We can rest in Christ this morning, July 5th, 2020. We can rest in Christ Jesus. But how do we hurdle these obstacles that stop us from resting in Christ? Well, first I want to identify the the obstacles I discovered in this text and, and see whether we can hurdle these things this morning, whether we can find rest in Jesus. The first obstacle is childishness. And the hurdle is very, very simply one of we have, we lack sympathy for the other. So we need to develop some sympathy. We need to develop a listening ear, if you please. Listen, when a society builds itself on the self-centered acquisition of things and power, one very natural outcome of that sort of society is taking sides, us against them. Groups form, they align themselves against competing groups, and what you find is only a common enemy will unite them. Sound familiar? Jesus painted this picture of childishness in the common terms of, of a brash situation on the playground if you please the the marketplace sure but you know that was the children's playground they that was uh, before they had playgrounds i guess now this childishness is not to be confused with childlikeness we will be there in a moment but in this childishness the children are doing what children do they play grown up have you ever done that do you remember doing that as a child i think some adults are still playing at the game <laughs> But uh, they're playing grown-up, and the boys are reenacting a wedding feast, and they are inviting others to join in the celebration dance. But, but typically, this round dance that they would do, you know, you've seen the movies of, of the, uh, the Greek weddings and Jewish weddings and all, where the guys are standing around, arms locked in a circle, and they're dancing. Do you notice something? It's always just the guys. That's a male job. Hmm, quite a strong division there, especially since the other group, the other half of these children, the girls, are playing and, and have gathered together to stage a funeral. That was the game they wanted to play, where typically the mourners are female. Interesting. The girls invite the boys to wail, the boys invite the girls to dance, and each refuse to join in such nonsense as this. Each one are saying, as it were, ain't got time, ain't got no time for that, you know? Oh my goodness. It's not surprising that the groups will not cross sides 
and joined in the other's play. This generation, and, and by generation, this, this is an age which generates fervent side-taking, us in, against themness, and it frustrates the Lord. He said, to what shall I compare this generation? It's like a bunch of children. It seems there's no pleasing people. A people that are so driven by ideology and fear and self-defense. The ministry of John the Baptist had climaxed an age of prophecy, which seemed at least to focus on the judgment of God, and many people didn't like that message. Folks thought he was demon-possessed. Jesus began a new age, which very clearly focused on outcasts. We read a little bit about it. You read earlier in this chapter, and throughout the Gospels, you hear the emphasis. Jesus spent his time with tax collectors and sinners and defenseless children. And as a result, people could only see him as a glutton and a drunkard. Because it overwhelms our attention and subverts our affection for God, side-taking Childishness keeps us from finding Christ. To hurdle this childishness, let's learn from the other side. You've got to listen to them to, for that to happen. Listen to one another. Learn from the other side why it is that they play their games. Listen deeply enough to understand what the flute playing and the dirge singing is all about. Second obstacle is hard-heartedness. a hard-hearted rejection of the message of Christ. The hurdle that will help us over that is compassion. Jesus pronounced these woes on the unrepentant cities of Chorazin and Capernaum. Jesus proclaimed the gospel there, and he per per performed miracles in these two cities. But they had rejected Jesus and his message. So he compared them to the ancient cities of Tyre and Sidon and Sodom, the story we all know very much about, about Sodom and Abraham. These kinds of places, these Old Testament places, these, these places, had, places had rejected God's call for justice and for mercy. So they fell in self-destructive conflict. That's what the history books report. And Jesus said, he, he remarked that if these ancient cities had profited from or had the opportunity to or could have heard Jesus and seen the message that he presented the same way that he had offered that to Chorazin and to Capernaum, those ancient cities would have understood and received him. That's what Jesus proclaimed. They'd still be around today. Hard-heartedness keeps us from resting in Christ. Where's your heart? Where's my heart? eating and drinking with common folk. Jesus came to tax collectors and sinners, those irreligious people of the day. In fact, that's exactly what the word sinners in, the, in this sense means. Uh, it's talking about the irreligious uh, people. Folks who haven't got time for church, I guess. And he came with healing and good news of relief for the oppression and from the oppression for those who needed it the most. So when John's disciples came to find out if Jesus was the one that they should expect, if he was really the one uh, uh, whom God had told us to anticipate, the Messiah, Jesus told John's disciples, you go tell John this, the blind see, lepers are raised, are cleansed from the dead, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Well, listen, that program of unmerited grace stuck in the craw. It didn't go down very well with the hard-hearted. This unmerited favor of God on people who didn't deserve it. Well, in my righteous indignation, I refuse to accept that. So I re reject Jesus out of hand. Listen. Jesus brought a message of grace and mercy with a call for justice, and the world rejected him. But still, the world does this because the world, as I'm defining or using the term world, is controlled by those who fear what, to, that they might lose what they have grabbed from the lives of the common folk. And that fear is real, and it, it causes us to make a lot of decisions, wrong decisions. And rejecting Jesus, we seal our fate. That's what Jesus was saying. 
I don't care if you call it hard-heartedness, self-righteousness, judgmentalism, whatever you want to call it. This rejection of the good news short-circuits any rest, any freedom that we might find in Jesus. So I say, open your hearts with the same sort of compassion Jesus showed. Open our hearts with compassion for the same folks for whom Jesus showed compassion. Try that on for size. It'll change your life. The next hurdle has to do with enlightenment. What I've dubbed enlightenment, it's, he talks about the intelligent and the wise of the world in these methods of the world. And the hurdle probably primarily for us is one of pride. Jesus turned in praise to God the Father and he thanked the Father for what seems like another mystery to me. Apparently, God reveals himself not to the wise and the intelligent, the learned, the seminary trained even, so much as he does to the enlightened, uh, to, the, to the, those who turn their hearts to Christ. This is a false enlightenment, is what uh, Jesus was saying and what I'm saying this morning. God reveals himself to the infant, the childlike, not the childish. Here's that distinction. So what is it to be childlike? In this case, I've come to understand this. Before one's life is totally compromised by the structure of a culture, that pushes us into groups of us versus them, for instance, and igniting our urge for scapegoats. Children are innocent, essentially. They're innocent enough to hear the love of God for what it is, a spiritual and holy and effective outreach of grace. Adults who would humble themselves as children can also experience this grace. Given the story that we've been looking at, uh, the, this, this grace works out in a compassion for the, uh, for the world that surprises us or even offends us. And uh, I would suggest this, let, let those who think they're enlightened, whatever ilk you are of, whatever side you come from, we come from, listen to this, hear this. I'll try to be as balanced as I've always tried to be with Christ in the radical center. To the liberal, God is not calling for more institutionalized social services or entitlement. To the so-called conservative, God is not expecting stricter control of the so-called welfare parent, nor does God necessarily prefer a trickle-down economy. These things we read backward from both sides into the scripture, I fear. In Jesus Christ, if you're listening to the gospel, if you're hearing what Christ is saying, if you're receiving the spirit of Christ, you're understanding this. God reaches out to the poor simply because it is the right thing to do. They are his children. He loves them and he cares for them just as, he much, as much as he does you or me. Reaching out to the outcast is a crucial expression of God's love. Wealth as such then is not to be hoarded and protected and amassed and controlled. The abundance which God provides is to be available to meet the needs of all. Yeah, that's a frightening thought, I know, for some people. And some people then would reject the message of Christ. God forbid. So children and the enlightened, the wise... If the children are not yet caught up in this endless conflict that I've described here above, the children can get it. They can understand it. I thank the Lord for this. Some people get it. Some adults get it. Four words. Violence, no. Love, yes. That's the answer. Jesus will make this God known to you if you want to meet him, if you want to hear him and see him. And it's simple truth that seems to be said over and over again until it's deeply instilled in our hearts and souls. You are God's beloved. And so is everyone else. Now, you are God's beloved is life-changing. And so is everyone else is also life-changing. It's that second phrase that keeps our eyes open. God so loved the world, the entire world. <clears throat> worldly enlightenment, conventional wisdom, worldly wisdom. 
this false intelligence hinges on thinking and believing that the ways uh, that the world must work involve a justice which is, which is affected by violence and retribution. And that's a false enlightenment. It is a lie, a hubris, a damning pride which keeps us from finding rest in Christ. Oh, I pray that we would lay aside our false knowledge and embrace the truth of God's love for everyone. That would change our criteria for who's wise, who's smart. Knowing the power of God's love, that's, that's true enlightenment. Final situation, final obstacle. <clears throat> The yokes. Now, Jesus has only talked about one yoke. Take my yoke upon you. But that implies that there's some other yokes. At least it does to me as I've come to understand this. And we need to hear it because we, are, we need to hurdle the entanglements of this life if we're going to find rest in Christ. The childishness, hard-hearted, the falsely enlightened, uh, this world places burdens on folks that lock them in to play by the rules of the world. That's the slavery to the world that Paul talks about. And these are the burdens that Jesus offers to lift from us. These are the yokes which Jesus is offering to replace for us. But we steep and stew in these burdens because, frankly, we don't know any better. We don't know any better way until we find Jesus. Here's how it works. A child learns. We learn our values and desires from our parents and siblings and friends and foes. And we become like those with whom we associate. Like it or not, it's true. We become like those on whom we focus, whether positive or negative. Learn from godly parents, become more godly. It's a good thing. You focus on beating an enemy long enough and hard enough, and eventually you'll begin to resemble that enemy, doing the same things, saying the same things, thinking the same ways. The paradox of all this in Western society at least, and I believe worldwide, is that all this is experienced under the cloak of a lie it is a blinding lie which prevents us from seeing what we need to see. The lie is that you are your own person, that I make my decisions in a vacuum from all else. I tell you, that's a lie. In fact, we are always shaped by our relationships with others. That's what shaped who you are. You couldn't have come through childhood, infancy and childhood, into adolescence and adulthood without having been shaped by people. So we're always yoked to someone or something. Paul talks about it. He's, he talks about us either being slaves to sin or slaves to Christ. So I'm not saying something new here. I'm describing what is really before us. And this suggests this final obstacle, very clearly, I think, these entanglements, or what I would call false and failing yokes. Now, what does a yoke do? I hope you're certainly aware by now that we're not talking about the yolk of an egg, right? Okay. I'm talking about the yoke that they use, the oxen or the horses use to, to put a team together, put a team together. A yoke unites. It's not designed to be used by, uh, by a solo person. It's designed to be used by two or arguably more. A yoke unites and joins energies toward a common goal, a common way of pulling the load of living. The law, there's several yokes that we can identify. The law was considered to be a yoke that joined humanity to bring with, with humanity, the, the law was that yoke, to join with humanity to bring justice and peace to create a wonderful way of living. But sin took the opportunity to take the law and to turn the law into an instrument of condemnation and death. That's the trouble with legalism. All the law ultimately can show us is where we're wrong. Show up our, our evil, our wrongness, our fears. We read that Wednesday night from Romans. A rabbi and his teachings were considered to be a yoke. 
leading a student to become like the master. You would yoke yourself to the master. You would, you would become like him. And if the teacher, I tell you, if the teacher's yoked to Jesus, that could be a good thing. But if not, oh me. A crowd, a group may yoke good folk together uh, and, and accomplish great tasks. Or the accuser might infiltrate the crowd and turn them into a lynch mob. So seeing the reality of our conjoined, communal, intertwined lives, Jesus offers himself as our best, our most trustworthy partner. Matthew eleven twenty nine through 30. Take my yoke, you see. The emphasis isn't on yoke. It's the emphasis on whose the yoke is. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. In closing, I underscore those characteristics. He's gentle. This is a gentleness. Fascinating word as it's used in the New Testament and, and the Greek translation of the Old Testament. He is gentle, but it's like... It's, it's, a, it's a gentleness that controls great power. Some of your equine people, horse riders, it's the gentleness of a light touch through the reins of a horse, holding the reins of a horse. Great power. He's humble. Christ, God, is not in, in rivalry with anyone. Christ is not a rival of any or in rivalry with anyone. The humility of Jesus is not produced by coercion, nor does it coerce. It just doesn't work that way. We can hardly understand a humility which is not brought about by the thumb of a, a stronger pressure. That's not where God is in his humility. His humility is the product of complete obedience to the Father, making himself available, as we've already identified, to everyone on every level of life. His yoke is easy. That word is used in a, a way that suggests in some places pleasantness. Did you think about that? His yoke is easy. It act, it's actually enjoyable to be yoked to Christ. I've known some Christians that made me wonder about that. But it should be enjoyable to be a believer and yoked to Christ. And finally, his yoke is light. The yoke of Christ imposes no burdens. Romans tells us in Christ there is no condemnation. This yoke of Christ offers lightness and, and illumination for a vibrant life. And so I finally just would say, be yoked to Christ Jesus. Be yoked to Christ. May God bless us as we seek to rest in Jesus Christ and we come over all these obstacles which would prevent us amen musicians let's come and let's celebrate the rest of Christ sing along with us at home. We'll start with let's just praise the Lord, followed by Lord I lift your name on high, and ending with the hymn O for a thousand tongues to sing.
thank you for worshiping with us. I pray that you open your heart to all that God has and is giving us through his Son, Jesus Christ. May his Spirit fill us and enable us with grace and peace. I also thank you for your continued support of the ministry at the First Baptist Church of Bryson City. You can find online giving options on our webpage at firstbaptistchurchbc.org. The office is open during the week from 8 to 12, and you can send mail the old-fashioned way at Post Office Box 247, Bryson City, North Carolina, 28713. Pray for us. Serve with us. Love God. Love others. Do justice. Love mercy. Walk humbly with God. And God bless you.